Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. We are at the Great Telco Debate 2019 and I'm talking with Phil Sorsky, who is Senior Vice President, Service and Provider Sales EMEA at Comscope. Phil, we haven't met before. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks for talking to us. Let's start with this. I know a fair few companies in the telecoms industry. I don't know Comscope. What do you do? Well, we're a $10 billion turnover company based in <laughs> North Carolina, USA. Uh, we provide basically all of the passive infrastructure for telco, whether it's fibre in the ground, fibre above the ground, uh, exchanges, ODFs in the exchanges, that kind of thing. We're also very large in the wireless space. Um, we provide macro antennas to virtually every wireless operator on the planet. And as well as the antennas themselves, we provide all the passive equipment, filters, combiners, uh, fiber and coax cabling, etc. And you may recognize us from the, the microwave antennas that we make with the old red flash, the Andrew flash, which is one of our brands in the microwave space. Seen them all over the world. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big and small. Yes, yes. Right. That puts us in context. What do you think are the key takeaways related to 5G for this year? Well, I think 5G, you know, the, the, the 5G race has begun. Uh, we're absolutely seeing evidence now from all of the operators that they're making plans for 5G, some sooner than others, depending on which part of the world you're talking about. But the actual implementation has been relatively slow. And I think that's because the, the clear cut use case for 5G is yet to truly emerge. Uh, what we're seeing in the short term is 5G seems convenient to relieve congestion in certain downtown you know, city locations, Paris, London, New York, etc. And that's the initial driver. I think as we exit this year and move into next year, the next driver will actually be uh, uh, um, uh, bragging rights, uh, jealousy, if you like, because 5G handsets are starting to appear. When your friend in the pub has 5G on their handset and you don't, th there'll be a need to go and get 5G. So whether the operators like it or not, I think unfortunately for them, they're going to be compelled to accelerate the 5G rollouts, if only for marketing needs. But I think the, the real benefits of 5G are yet to to even be realized, even envisioned, because that's, that's still yet to come in 2021, 22, 23, et cetera. Do you think the CSPs, the operators, are actually ready for 5G overall? Some will be more ready than others, obviously, but what's your take on that? Yeah, I think they are because, um, you know, regardless of the, the wireless capability of 5G, you still need uh, the benefits of a fibre footprint. Without fibre, there is no 5G. So although it's a wireless world, it still needs wires to make that wireless world happen. And the evidence we're seeing is that, that all of the operators, whether they're combined, fixed and wireless operators or wireless only, they do seem to be gearing at their backbone to be, to be able to handle the huge amount of data that 5G will generate, particularly once video is taken into account. Okay. Let's move on to you then, and Comscope. How are you supporting the operators as they begin to roll out 5G? Well, I think we're, we're helping in two areas. Uh, firstly, in the macro, um, the, the, there is a big challenge with 5G in terms of the cost of rollout. And one of those costs are antennas, passive antennas or active antennas. Generally speaking, the large OEMs are pushing the active antenna route, but they are incredibly expensive. Mm. Not only are they expensive, they're very heavy, and therefore the structural support needed on a rooftop or a tower is much higher than a passive antenna. And thirdly, they consume a lot of power. So what we're doing is we've brought our passive antenna solutions, 8T8R type antennas, which will allow you to still achieve 5G performance, massive MIMO type performance, but at a fraction of the cost. So in those locations where active makes sense, such as Oxford Circus London, fine, you can go, go, go active. But in other places like maybe uh, up halfway up Tottenham Court Road or near Euston Station or whatever, where you don't need to incur that massive expense, then we have very good macro solutions, both in the antenna space and also in the fibre feed to those antennas, and that, that's all outdoors. Equally, on the indoor side, when you consider most data is still generated from people inside a building, and we now have very attractive solutions for indoor coverage, which not, are not only single operator, but multi-operator, so you can have simultaneous operators all connected into the same internal footprint and at a fraction of the cost of traditional distributed antenna type systems. You are responsible for EMEA, Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, what do you find, obviously, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're not going to be talking much about 5G, but in other markets in Europe and the Middle East, etc., what differences are you seeing in terms of the way CSPs are looking at deployment of 5G? 
I would say overall, um, not a lot of difference, to be honest. Certainly in the Middle East, there are countries where uh, investment is, is not a problem. They, they have the, uh, the dollars, the euros, etc., to be able to invest whatever they wish. And, and they're more kind of showcase scenarios. And we see uh, very aggressive rollouts from, from those kinds of countries. But in Western Europe, we, we see, a, I'd say, a relatively careful approach, a considered approach. But in all cases, I think the operators have woken up to the fact of the, the bragging rights need, the marketing need, that will come in 2020 and therefore that they are all getting ready uh, in one way or another. Now you might find that between countries there might be a couple of months difference, even within a country between operators there might be a couple of months difference, but generally they all seem to be moving into the same space and that's 5G readiness to coincide for when the 5G handsets are truly ubiquitous as opposed to niche which they are at the minute. Going back to the point about uh, 5G handsets mm. uh, readiness and so on, yeah. and uh, when um, uh, Faraday invented the first generator, as it were, that yep. was the early 19th century. Yep. It was about 45 years later that Edison inv invented the light bulb. And the light bulb was virtually uh, you know, the, the perfect reason to invent an electricity generator. And yet it took 45 years for that to happen. It was about another 50 years before somebody invented air conditioning which also relied upon electricity to, to make it work. So the speed of innovation back in the 19th century, 45 years for the bulb, another 50 years for aircon. And when Faraday invented that generator, he didn't have a clue how people were gonna use it. He didn't envisage the light bulb or the air conditioning or all of the other things that we use electricity for, such as video cameras and TVs and so on and so on. And I think a similar scenario is about to kick off with 5G. We've no idea what we're about to unleash in, in a good way, but, but, but things will happen because of 5G. I think the Chinese, but part of my remit in the past has been Asia Pac, and the Chinese government don't just see 5G as the next G. It's not 3G, 4G, 5G. They see 5G as literally the next industrial revolution. And so things like permit rights in China have been relaxed with the wireless operators to make sure that 5G permeates as fast as possible. Because they, they think as a nation, uh, GDP can be increased significantly by embracing what 5G could offer. And as I say, it's still yet to be proven between the Internet of Things and ultra reliable, low latency, uh, virtual reality video, all these things that 5G promises. We don't quite know how it will play out, but I'm convinced that it will play out in, in ways that we can't even imagine. And it'll be much faster than going from uh, Faraday to, uh, to the first light bulb, to the first air conditioning unit. In a way then, Phil, it is that same old cliche as the word, I guess, if you build it, they will come. So what's happening in, in China, and I guess in other places, is this technology is going to happen, we're going to be ready for it, mm -hmm. and we're not sure exactly how it's going to change us, but it is, and it's also going to affect our economy massively, yes. and the global economy as well. Yes, ab absolutely. And even, uh, you know, talking about within the economy, what we're starting to see now, a, l a lot more interest in private, it was private LTE when 4G was around, it's now more shifting to pr private 5G. And we're seeing a lot of cases now where countries, as they as they allocate spectrum or as they auction off spectrum in the 5G space, they're reserving certain bands just for private LTE, mm. uh, or rather private 5G. And the cost per corporate to use that piece of spectrum is actually very low. In certain countries, you apply for a permit and it can be $75, $100, so relatively inexpensive to deploy a private 5G network. So we anticipate in 2020 and beyond, uh, a literally an exponential take up in terms of private 5G within manufacturing environments, within campus environments and so on. And that's what will have this big economic effect. The generally accepted sort of way it's, things are expected to go for 5G is the enterprise first and then out to the general public Whatever, end user, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Do you think the sort of thing you've just been talking about with the private 5G is very well known yet? Is, are people starting to pick up on it? No, I don't think it's very well known. Mm. Uh, certainly the more advanced corporations, like for instance the large car manufacturers in Germany, they're, mm -hmm. they're already on top of this and they've got people within their traditional IT department who are becoming relatively expert in this space. Most corporates, it's still something they're not aware of, but I think they very quickly will during, during the course of next year. But in terms of 5G and you know, is it going to be consumer-led or corporate-led, I think perhaps with 5G this could be the, the first G that is actually going to be both. 
because, because of the many things it can do within the corporate space, it leads to more efficiency, more productivity, and therefore, I guess, more profit ultimately for, for, for the corporate. And that can, that can fuel their hunger and their, their appetite for it. Within the consumer space, when we talk about the analogy of televisions, HD ready, the amount of data you'll be able to transmit on a 5G link will make high definition TV an absolute reality. It's, you know, it's an exponentially higher bandwidth than it was even with 4G. And the consumers are attracted to that. Consumers love video. Consumers love pictures, the, the eye to the flame in the fire type of thing. <laughs> they, they find that compelling. And as content providers find ways to exploit this whole new paradigm that they hadn't even thought about, then I think consumers will also pull it through as well. So I, I actually see it happening in tandem. But it's always been said, well, the received wisdom has been that corporates, enterprises, big enterprises have the money to be able to afford 5G, such as it is at the start, and the consumer will come along later when some kind of monetization and things settle out a bit and you can see mm -hmm. what's worth doing and what isn't. Yeah. I take your point about the video. I came in on the tube this morning and were, I was surrounded by five or six exactly. different blokes watching yeah. different football matches. Yeah, all, all under the age of 30, I guess. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it, it's happening. Yeah, but, yeah. So what do you make of that difference between yeah. the money for 5G from the corporates and from yeah. the enterprises and waiting to see what the model will be for the consumer? Yeah. Well, for the consumer, I, I take your point, normally the corporates always have a lot more cash to invest in these things. And certainly for, for private LTE, a corporate can afford that in a way that a consumer couldn't do in their home. They're, they're not going to put private 5G in their home. They'll just have very good Wi-Fi mm. uh, within the building. But from a cost of a 5G service, what we're already seeing is a collapse in the idea that an operator can charge a premium for 5G because it turns out they can't, because of this marketing bragging rights uh, competitive dynamic between operator A and operator B, they're finding that they're having to offer 5G services more or less at the same tariff as they were offering 4G. So from an affordability point of view for the service, then the consumer, I think, can afford it. And then the secondary question is the handset and whether people are willing to spend another $500, $750, $1,000 on a new handset. But I think as we've seen, we're up to the uh, the Apple um, 11, 11 Pro or whatever yep. now. Consumers have probably a much bigger appetite for spending on a, a piece of CP than I ever envisaged 30 years ago, when people now will regularly spend $1,000 on the device that they feel that they need. Which still astonishes me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, a grand for a handset. Unbelievable. It's just, yeah. But you think it'd go up to 1250 or? 1,500 people still buy it? Certainly will in Silicon Valley. Well, well they are. in the city here. Yeah, but. yeah no, I, th I think they already are. If you look at the, 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 the high-end iPhones, for instance, they are running to $1,200, $1,500, so, and people buy them by, by their dozens. Yeah. Astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. Very interesting interview. Yeah. Phil, thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much.